guys, it's Sam from DIY Huntress, and today I'm going to show you how I made a live edge dining table with a welded steel base for my family. Spoiler alert, I totally welded that base by myself, and it was my first welding project ever. Don't believe me? Keep watching. Well, if you believe me, also keep watching. Let's get started. <laughs> This project was made possible by my amazing friends at the Home Depot and Dab Products. My parents have been asking me for a custom live edge dining table for the longest time to host our large holiday parties that we have with our families, but I haven't really had the faith in my abilities or my skill set to be able to build one until really recently. So to get started, I brought them to one of my favorite places on earth, NY City Slab, where they picked out some locally sourced ash slabs to use for their dining room table. And because we like to go big or go home in my family, the slabs they chose were so large that I actually had to commandeer my dad's garage because they would not fit in my shed shop. And that meant that first line of business was to measure and cut these slabs to a little bit longer than their final dimension of seven and a half feet in order to make them a little more manageable to work with, especially during glue up. So to get started, I measured where I wanted to make my cuts and then added a straight edge as a guide and used one of my brand new brushless circular saws just to cut through the slab and make a really nice clean edge. And as you guys know, as with this tool and all the other tools and materials that I use in this project, as well as all of my projects, you can find a full list of the materials and the step-by-step -step plans for this particular table on my website by clicking on the link below this video. After rough cutting the slabs and then saving the off cuts for a rainy day because I just love scrap wood, I asked my dad to come hang with me in the garage to let me know what he wanted his table to look like. There were some really awesome live edges, but we're only keeping two of them, so I wanted to know which one he wanted and how wide he wanted his table to be. Cut here, cut there, join us together in the middle. But after some brainstorming and a lot of measuring and remeasuring, it was time to get to work. I have no clue what she's doing. She's got me ripping out dead trees, when no. crepe myrtles in from I think California they came in, and they look like twigs. Dad, this isn't a therapy Meantime. <laughs> so after hanging with my dad, which I really love doing, it was time for what was the scariest part of the project, and that was cutting the live edge off of one side of each of the slab, and I did this by using a track saw. Now, if you don't have a track saw, you can use a circular saw and a straight edge for this, but my best advice is to get a fine wood cutting blade to make sure that the cut is perfect because this is where you'll be joining the two boards together. Since I don't have any heavy duty large scale machinery in my workshop, my buddy Rob at New York City Slab actually did flatten these slabs for me before I picked them up. But I did notice that one of the slabs was a little thicker and there was also a spot that was not so stable. So I just flipped the slab over and added some shims to stabilize it and to level it. And then I used a power hand plane to remove some of the material from the thicker slab just so that the thickness of the two slabs will match once I join them together, thus making them into one really cool even tabletop. Now, if you don't have a power planer like this one, you could use a belt sander or also a router with a router sled. Those are a couple of options that I have seen on YouTube, but this is actually what I had on hand and I bought this at my local Home Depot years ago and it really worked. I just had to make sure to take off really small passes at a time. After planing and getting the slabs to the same thickness, I actually got my hands on a shop vac finally and just cleaned up my mess to prepare for joinery. I then busted out my tape measure and started to mark where I wanted to place my biscuits for the joinery process. In most other videos where people are joining live edge slabs together, I've seen them use dominoes, but I actually only have a biscuit joiner on hand and I bought this thing at Home Depot a couple years ago. Spoiler alert, it actually worked really, really well. One thing I did find helpful though was that the dust collection bag on the biscuit joiner wasn't the hottest so I did take a vacuum to all of the joints that I created to clean them out and then after doing that I just prepped the concrete that the slabs were laying on to protect it from getting dirty during the glue up. Now if you've been watching my videos you'll know that I do have a go-to glue. I really love using my Dap Carpenters glue for pretty much every project so I figured I'd try it for this project as well. I just added an ample amount of glue, spread it around pretty evenly on both of the sides I was joining, put the biscuits in their slots, and then added even more glue on top of that. 
I then began to press the biscuits into each of the slots and then began the clamping process. The clamping process was a little stressful because it was really warm out and the slabs were so big, so I did call in a couple of extra hands to help me with this to make sure that there was clamping pressure on all of the necessary parts of the slabs and to make sure that the two slabs were joined together nice and tightly because I want them to stay together forever. One of the things that I did run into was that clamping the live edge was a little strange and I could have made a couple of custom jigs, but I didn't even think about doing that beforehand and at this point it was too late. So I did add a couple of two by fours in between some of the clamps to help with the pressure and it worked really well. After a stressful night of clamping the two slabs together and dropping a lot of bad words, I crossed my fingers and came back the next day to remove all of the clamps and was so excited to see that the glue up was actually a huge success and that there was a really strong tabletop ready to be worked with. And since I had initially cut it down to slightly shorter than eight feet, my dad did help me move the tabletop into my shed shop where I did prep it for a resin pour because there were some pretty bad cracks and stress fractures that needed to be taken care of. To prep for the pour, I vacuumed out all of the nooks and crannies and then I started taping up any of the voids that went all the way through the slab. I also had a pretty bad crack that was causing some unleveling, so I added a straight edge to this and just clamped it to the table. I then sat under the table for what felt like a lifetime and just continued to tape up all of the voids. But once everything was prepared, it was time for the resin pour and I mixed up some deep pour epoxy with some brown pigment in order to match the table. Now, if there's anything I learned here and if there's any wisdom I can pass on, it's just don't use deep pour epoxy when you're filling the voids in the table. It was actually so watery that it ended up seeping through a lot of the tape. So I basically had to let the first resin pour cure overnight and then I had to come back and add a thicker tabletop resin on top of it the next day in smaller increments. After spending a couple of days pouring epoxy and then allowing it to cure, I then began to level out the epoxy. I started with the belt sander, but it wasn't really working, so I went back to my hand planer and it worked so beautifully. So I basically just used the hand planer to get rid of any of the last minute high spots and to remove any of the excess epoxy resin to prep the slab for final sanding later. Next, it was time to cut the tabletop to its final dimension. And I used my track saw here to cut it down to a solid seven and a half feet long. And again, if you don't have a track saw, you could use a circular saw along with a straight edge. Just make sure you have a fine blade so that it leaves a really nice clean cut on the edge of your table. Next was obviously my least favorite part of the project because I hate sanding, but I began to sand the top of the table to prep it for its final coat later in the process. And since there wasn't a lot of bark on this live edge, I actually just used my sander with 80 grit sandpaper to remove any of the grit and grime from the live edge and then worked the entire table all the way to about 400 grit later in the process. After I was done giving a lot of love to the top of the slab, my other half came to help me move the slab into my workshop so I could prep the bottom. And this thing was super heavy, and so I really needed some help with the lifting throughout this process. But basically, I just set it up on three separate workhorses and made sure everything was level, and then got started on the bottom of the table by removing all of the leftover tape from the resin pour. This process took a lot of elbow grease, some chisels, some acetone, a little bit of sanding, but eventually I was able to remove all of the tape, and then I began to finish sand the bottom of the table as well. As much as I hated sanding, my reward was that I got to weld the next day. So I got started by setting up a folding welding station in a well ventilated area of my dad's garage. Now I've never welded before but I was introduced to the concept at WorkbenchCon last year and after talking to Lincoln about how intimidating welding seemed to me they sent me their PowerMig 210 MP to try and basically this machine does not require any gas you just plug it into a regular outlet and then it has settings on it already that pretty much auto set what you need based on the material you're using. After getting comfortable with the machine, it was time to jump right in and get started. And I started by using my new angle grinder and a 60 grit flat disc to clean all of the steel to prep it for welding. I then suited up and started practicing with some practice pieces before diving on in and working with the good pieces that I was saving for the table. I'm really bad at this. This is so much harder than I thought it would be. But you guys, after a couple of hours of practicing, I actually did get a lot better and eventually I was ready to move on to the actual steel that I was using for this project. Now, one thing that made my life a lot easier was the steel warehouse that I went to on Long Island. They did cut these pieces very square for me at the dimensions that I needed. So I just attached them using a couple of clamps, checked and double checked and triple checked for square and then started to weld them together. And although the welds weren't perfect, they were really strong. So I did go in with my angle grinder yet again to just grind everything down and smooth out the welds once I was done. 
Altogether, I welded two table bases and two bench bases, but I needed to be able to weld them to some flat stock in order to attach them to the table. So I brought my flat bars over to my drill press along with a metal drilling bit and drilled half inch openings throughout each one in order to attach them to the table base later using threaded inserts. Now, one of the things I did learn in asking and researching was that I needed the openings for the threaded inserts and bolts to be a lot wider than the bolts that I was using so that when the table contracts and expands, it leaves room for these table bases to naturally move without cracking or breaking the wood. But once they were ready to go, I cleaned them up, brought them back to my welding station, attached the base to the flat stock, tacked everything into place after checking square, and then basically did a happy dance after realizing that I successfully welded my base to my flat stock. Next, my best friend, my angle grinder, and I ground down all of the ugly welds, and I also sanded everything down flat to prepare all of the bases for priming and painting. I also wiped everything down nice and clean. So the primer that I use for these bases is a metal filling primer and what that does is allow me to kind of build up a couple of layers and sand away any imperfections or any high or low spots. So I added about three layers of primer to each one of the legs and the benefit of this too is that it is also going to help prevent them from rusting. Now as you can see there are four bases, two big ones and two small ones. The smaller ones are going to be for a live edge bench that I'll be making to match the dining table at a future date. So if you're interested in that video make sure to subscribe to my channel and click the notification button so that you don't miss that. In the meantime though I did finish off the legs with a couple of coats of a black enamel spray and then as those dried I started to prep some c-channel for my table which is going to help the table from warping or twisting in the future. Nothing too crazy here. I basically just did the same thing I did with the flat stock. I used my drill press and a metal drilling bit in order to drill half inch openings for the bolts and the threaded inserts to fit into later. I then brought the C-channel over to my table and started to lay out where they needed to go. Now this is an age-old debate of whether or not C-channel is necessary or not. I decided to err on the side of caution here and installed the C-channel as essentially faux breadboards. I just marked where I wanted them to go about 8 to 10 inches inward from the outside of the table drilled some pilot holes for my router to sit, and then set up a couple of straight edge guides just so I could run my router back and forth across the board to create two deeper grooves and then a small, short, shallow groove in the center for the C-channel to lay flush inside the table. Once the C-channel was installed, I pre-drilled some holes through the drilled holes that I made with my drill press for the threaded inserts. I then vacuumed out all the debris, removed the C-channel from the inside of the table, and then began to install the threaded inserts using a tiny bit of epoxy and some woman power. At this point I just wanted to run a dry fit so I placed the C-channel back into the grooves and then added the threaded bolts that I chose that fit inside of the threaded inserts and everything actually surprisingly worked out really well. I was really nervous about this part and I was really pleased with how it turned out. But once everything fit great I then removed the C-channel and began to finish the underside of the table and I did the same thing on the top as well which you'll see in a little bit. Since I didn't have the type of metal equipment required to cut 45 degree angles in my square tubing, my really awesome friend John Malecki who helped me with so much of this welding project advice wise told me to invest in these small square pegs to insert in the bottom of the tubing and that's exactly what I did. I just tapped them into place and it left these little really great plastic rubber feet on the bottom of the base which won't scratch the floor. And once those were in place, I placed the bases in their final resting spots and then marked and pre-drilled some holes for the threaded inserts. The beauty of threaded inserts are that they really do allow me to take the base of the table on and off as I please. And that works out really well because the table with the base is actually too big to fit through the door of my parents' house and we needed to take them off anyway to install the table. But basically, once I started installing the threaded rods, I did realize that my drill was a little too big for me to be able to get a perfect right angle when installing the bolts. So I just used a small right angle attachment on my drill and it worked perfectly. After installing the legs, I just wanted to make sure that everything was level and sturdy. So my dad came back to my workshop and helped me flip the table over, which was way heavy, but it was so awesome to see it kind of work in all of its glory once it was right side up. Damn! And once I patted myself on the back because everything was surprisingly level for my first metalworking project especially, I just added some water to raise the grain and then knock the grain down to about 400 grit with my sander before finally adding the wood finish to the top of the table as well. Mm -hmm. 
After allowing the penetrating finish to penetrate for a little bit, I actually went back and buffed away any of the excess and it was perfect timing because check this out. My mom hasn't seen the table yet and I think she just got home from work. <clears throat> hey mom. After seeing my mom's happy dance and seeing how happy she was, I let the table sit in the shop for about 24 hours and then called in some manpower to help me move in the slab first and then the legs separately. So as I mentioned before, the threaded inserts really did come in handy because we were able to remove the legs to fit the table through the door and then added the legs back onto the table in order to finish installing the dining table in its final resting place. I can't even describe how proud I was to see this table resting in its final place. I can't believe I made this, you guys. Like, who am I? I legitimately doubted my skills and my abilities to be able to create this giant tabletop and also weld the base since day one, and seeing it in the space just makes me feel so happy. It sounds so cliche, but if there's really one thing or two things that I learned doing this build, it's that A, if you put your mind and your abilities and your research to anything, you can literally accomplish anything. And B, if it wasn't for my supportive family and the supportive community of you guys and all of my maker friends, I don't know if this would have happened. What I do know for sure though, is that my parents will be hosting Thanksgiving again this year and I cannot wait to see my family and friends sitting at this custom table I built along with these gorgeous chairs from Home Depot and the bench that I will be building and publishing on my channel very shortly. And I know I say it all the time, but without the support of you guys and my amazing sponsors, I would not have opportunities to make really cool things like this and push the limits of what I can do. So thank you all so much for all of the support and love that you give me. I cannot wait to share my next project with you guys, but until then, happy DIYing.